in last week's lessons, we looked at two different ways of defining the notion of a computable function. We had the notion of recursive functions, which were building up these functions from a small stock of basic functions using a number of constructors. And then we introduced the idea of an abstract computing machine. We used register machines as an example of that and said that a computable function was one that could be computed by a register machine. Today's lesson, we will look at how it is that we can prove that both of these different ways of defining the notion come to define exactly the same class of functions. Something is one of the recursive functions if and only if it's computable by a register machine. So let's look at how we would show this in one direction. Let's show how we can show that the recursive functions are computable by register machine. This is the easy direction of the proof. The recursive functions are built up inductively. So, so to show that they're register machine computable, we first show that the basic functions are computable by a register machine. And then we show that if we can compute functions by means of a register machine, then so are the other functions that can be made out of them using the constructors. Once we've done all of that, it's, that shows that every recursive function can be computed by a register machine. So let's look at the basic functions. The zero function, that can be computed by a register machine just by zeroing out the first register and then stopping. No matter what input value is in register B1, at the end of the computation, that register is empty. So this calculates the zero function. The successor function is even easier. We just increment the first register and we're done. The identity functions are a little bit trickier. Some of them are very, very easy and the others are a little bit more complicated. The identity functions where we take a bunch of inputs and just return the first input, that can be done by doing no program at all. Just start, stop immediately what was in the first register is the answer. The other identity functions, which take one of the inputs other than the first input and makes that the answer, needs a little bit more work. What you do is you first empty the first register and then do a little loop to empty out register M and put its results in the first register. When that little computation is done, the number that was stored in register M is now stored in the first register. Those computations suffice to show that each of the basic recursive functions are register machine computable. The constructors need a little bit more work. Here we assume that the functions that we're combining together have already been encoded by register machines, and we just need to show that we can get a register machine which puts those instructions all together to make a register machine for the function that we're constructing out of them. I'm not going to go through all of the details of those, but I'll give you a flavor of how those things work. Let's look at composition, and I'll focus on the case where we've got a three-place function and we're composing that with three two-place functions. In the little block diagrams we were drawing for these functions, we have got no sense of what order we have to do everything in. You just picture the input going into G1, G2, and G3 all at the same time, and the results going into F. In a register machine program execution, you do these things one at a time. So let's imagine that I've got register machines which compute G1, G2, G3, and F. And let's try and do them in that order. Now, it's important to recognize that these little blue boxes on the screen, they're register machine programs. And the arrows going in and out aren't values going in and out, but that is the flow of the program execution. It's the arrows of the flow graph. As I'm going into G1, the code for G1 is expecting the input values to be in registers 1 and 2, and it's going to put its output value in register 2. But I mean, sorry, in register 1. But what we want for G2 
it's also expecting the input values of the whole function. But now, if we've done G1 first, it's put its output value uh, in the place where G2 was expecting the input of the whole function to be. And then it's going to put its output back in register, uh, register 1. And G3 also expects the same inputs. Uh, and it puts its output there. But then F, what we want F to have is the result of G1 and the result of G2 and the result of G3. And so what we're going to need to do is in between all of these stages, we're going to need to um, shuffle values around so that they're stored and recovered in the right sort of way. So what I'm going to need to do before the computation starts is copy the input values from registers 1 and 2 and store them away in new registers so that I can recover them for G2 and for G3 to use. And then the output of G1 we need to store away somewhere so that we can then recover that to put into the input fun for function f. And same for g2 and for g3. And once we've wired all of that together, we have our results. We've needed to use five new registers to do all of this, I think. And with all of that shuffling around, we can just use the code that we had for g1, g2, G3 and F, run them all in that order. And now if the input is in registers B1 and B2, that uh, G1 computes G1 of those values, G2 computes G2 of those values, the code for G3 computes G3 of those values, then we recover those values, put them all back in the right place to run F to cover, uh, to compute F of the result of G1, G2, and G3 on those values, and it puts its answer in the answer register B1. And that was just one example of a two-place uh, function's input into a three-place function. And we could do this for any other kind of composition as well. And so that's how you can do composition with register machines. Now, notice the flow of execution of this program. It just starts at the left. It's all this bookkeeping, but then it does G1, more bookkeeping, then G2, bookkeeping G3, then more bookkeeping and G4. It just goes all the way from the left to the right. There's no loops in this other than whatever loops are inside G1, G2, G3, and F. Primitive recursion and minimization are not going to be like that. So let's look at primitive recursion. We'll focus on another concrete case, the primitive recursion of two functions, f and g, where f is a one-place function and g is a three-place function. So we're defining a two-place function by primitive recursion. And again, we'll be working with a register machine, which computes the functions that we're taking for granted, a register machine for f and a register machine for g. Now, the program that we're going to define to compute the primitive recursion of f and g is now not going to just start here and go through once. Rather, if I want to calculate a function applied to the inputs x and y, then in every case we need to go through f once to calculate the base case, but then the number of times that we use the step function g is going to depend on the value y. So we're going to have this loop that goes around the g case y times. So the general shape of our code will be going through f once, then we'll count down some counter and go through the g code as many times as we need, and then exit. Now the inputs for this register machine are going to be in bucket one and bucket two, because the function that we're computing, this primitive recursion function, expects two inputs, uh, the x input and the y input. But we're going to need to store these values at the beginning because we're going to need to use them again and again. You can see here when I apply the g function, I need to apply the g function to x and y, and then I also need to use x and y in the previous case for the primitive recursion. So my first step, even before I calculate f, to store those values in new registers, which I'll call c and d. 
Now, because the first thing that we want to do is to compute f on the inputs x and 0, when I do this, I keep the value of b1 in b1, but I also keep a copy in d to use again later, but I'll empty b2 into this new register c, which is called c because I'm going to count that down, because the value in the second input is basically the number of times I want to go into the loop. But now as I start f, the value of b1 is still in b1, but a copy is stored away in d. The value of b2, the second input, is now 0, and so we do f. And now, once that has been done, we've calculated f of x and 0, that where x is the number of things that were in b1, and we've got b2 empty, so we've calculated f and 0, and the result is now there in b1. So if my counter value, the second input, is 0, then I'm done. I don't need to go through the G loop. f of x and 0 is, ex sorry, f of x is exactly what I want to calculate. So I'll check for that by trying to count down my counter. And if the counter is empty, I'm done. And if it isn't, I've got more work to do. I need to go through the loop for g. And to do that, I need to set g up by having the first three registers set with the values that I want. First register contains the initial value x. Second register contains y, which in this case will be 0, because this will be the first time I'll be applying uh, the g function. And then the third register needs to contain the result of the previous computation. So I'll move those things around. First, I need to shove the result of the computation from the first register into the third. Then I retrieve my stored value for x, which is in register d, and put that back in the first register. And then for the second register, we copy the value for a new register E, which starts off as empty, into B2. Then we can compute G because the inputs are now all in the right place. And after we've done that, we increment the thing that is in register E, that's going up the next value of Y, ready to do another computation if we need to. And we test if we need to do another computation by decrementing the counter C. We go round our loop. And this is how you calculate primitive recursion. This is different to composition, which is just a straight linear left-right computation, in one end, out the other, never going through any loop except what was inside the individual functions that we were composing. Here, we introduce a new loop, but I can tell in advance that the number of times I go through this loop is governed by the value that is in register C. Nothing in this computation changes the value that's in register C. So if C contains, say, the value 500 while I go in, I know I'm going through this loop 500 times. That's not going to be like how minimization works, which is our last constructor that we need to code up in register machines. So again, let's just assume I'm doing the minimization of a particular kind of function, in this case a two-place function with two inputs, where we keep the first input fixed and we increment the second input to check and see whether we can get a value where the given function returns zero. So let's start with a register machine which com computes the two-place function f. I'm wanting to write a register machine instruction which just expects the input value x, and we compute you know, f of x of 0, check if that's 0, then if it is, we exit, and if it isn't, we try again, and we compute f of x of 1, etc. So this input value x is going to need to be used again and again and again, so we'll first copy it from bucket 1 into a new spare register, which are called d then I'm all set up to compute f for the first time. b1, bucket 1, contains the input value x. Uh, bucket 2 is empty, and so I compute f, and I check the result, and if the result is 0, that's good, we don't need to go through the loop again. But if the result isn't 0, we need to loop. So I need to set things up to compute f again. So I need to copy the things that are in d back into b1. And now I need to 
increment the value that I put into B2. So I'll use the register C for that. I'll increment C, copy it into B2, and loop. So the counter C starts off as 0 when I go in here the first time. And if the answer to the function was, was 0, then I know my result here is going to be 0. But otherwise, I go up 1, try again, go up 1, try again, go up 1, try again. And the thing that I want at the end is whatever was in the register C when I exit this loop. So the last thing that I do is I copy the value of register C into the result register B1. And that's where the computation ends. So here we've got a very different kind of loop. Now, the number of times that I go through the loop depends on the value of this register B1, which is the result of this computation F. And I have no idea whether that is going to mean I go through the loop 500 times, or I go through the loop once, or I never exit the loop. This allows for non-termination, and that's why the function that I'm computing is only partial. And so we're done. We have shown that we can define a register machine for absolutely every recursive function. We've got the basic register machines for the basic recursive functions, and then we've got ways of combining register machines using composition, primitive recursion, and minimization. And so every recursive function can be defined, can be calculated by a register machine. All we need to do is to do this in reverse and show that any register machine computes a recursive function. And that is a very different kettle of fish. Here's why it's a completely different kettle of fish. What we need to show is that absolutely any register machine program computes a recursive function. Maybe it's a partial function, maybe it doesn't always terminate, whatever. But just imagine somebody gives you a box of little register machine instructions, increment and decrement instructions, and you just randomly plug them together, pulling stuff out of this box just like it's a tangled you know, Christmas set of Christmas tree lights. And you just start it going. Then apparently, if you think of that as computing a function, the function that that computes has got to be recursive. Mightn't always terminate, but whatever thing it com computes is going to be a partial recursive function. Or so it has to be if this theorem is going to be correct. So I'm going to give you a high-level description of how this can be proved. I'm not going to go through that in as much detail as we did with the other direction. The first thing to notice is that we can define everything we need to know about the state of a register machine by means of a single number. Then we'll show that given a register machine, there is a primitive recursive function, which when given an input, x1, x2, 3, x4, up to xm, and n as an extra input, outputs the state that the register machine is in when fed the input data x1, x2, x3, up to xm, after n steps of the computation. And then we show that we can use minimization to extract exactly which step the computation halts, if there is one. Finally, we can put all of that together and then use a primitive recursive function to extract the output of the function from the state that the register machine is in at the final step of its computation. Now here, I'm using the notion of a primitive recursive function. What's a primitive recursive function? That's a recursive function that is defined out of the base functions just using composition and primitive recursion, not using minimization. Most of the functions that we have defined are not only recursive, but primitive recursive. Things like addition, multiplication, exponentiation, uh, division, predecessor, all of these things can be defined just using primitive recursive means without having to use minimization. So I'll give you a sketch of how each of those stages of the reasoning goes. First, for the state of the register machine, suppose the register machine uses registers 1 up to m. To keep track of what's going on in the computation, we need to keep track of what value is stored in each of the registers. 
And then we need to keep track of what instruction out of all of the instructions of the register machine is the current instruction. So if we number the instructions one up to K, and then if we let P0, P1, P2, 3P, P3 up to PM be the first M plus one prime numbers, so that's two, three, five, seven, etc. The state of our register machine will be represented as this one number. First, P0, that's the, the first prime off the rank, namely two, to the power of S, where S is the number of the current instruction, or it's zero if there's no more instructions that we can do. So that's when the register machine has terminated. And then each of the other prime numbers are raised to the power of B1, B2, up to Bm, namely the values in all of those registers. Now the neat thing about this number here is that we can decompose it into its parts. This is the nice thing about numbers. Every number can be uniquely factorized as a product of powers of primes like this. So if I hand you a number, you can think of it as encoding all of these other numbers inside it. First, I, you know, if I want to extract the value of the number s, I divide this number by two, because p0 is two, divide it by two, and as many times as I can evenly, and the number of times that two goes into it is the value s that is stored. And then if I wanted to extract the value b1, I divide it by three as many times as I can evenly. And the value p2, I divide it by five, and so on. So there's a way, just using primitive recursive functions, to extract each of these other numbers from this single number. And so the neat thing about this, if I give you a number like this, if the number is odd, then you know that the value of s is zero, and that means we have no more instructions left to execute, and the machine has got to a halting state. So that's encoding the state in which the computation is as a single number. Now next we're going to think of the transition function. This is the primitive recursive function which when given uh, an input x1, xm up to xn, outputs the state that the register machine is in when it started off with these values x1, x2 up to xm in the first m registers after n steps of computation. And the way that we'll do this is by, we'll define it by primitive recursion, telling you what is the case where n is zero, and that's just the register machine is starting. And so we set it up like this. We say we start in instruction one, which is where the uh, register machine in, starts. And then the state of the register machine, it's got x1 in the first register, x2 in the second register, xm in the mth register. So I just do that massive multiplication and exponentiation, which is a primitive recursion. So that's the base case. And then to do the uh, transition, I go from one state to the next. And for this, this is going to be a big, long, complicated primitive recursive function, which, given the state of the machine at step n, returns the state of the machine at the next state, step. Now, for this, we need to extract the power of 2 that divides into the state to see what state we're in, and then we just look up the code of the register machine set of instructions to see what the next thing that we do when we're in that state might be. Given an increment instruction, we just add one to a register. So if it's register i that I'm adding one to, I'm just multiplying the state number by the ith prime, by pi, and then I just change the instruction that I need to have to the next instruction number, or zero if it terminates. So that's a multiplication by pi, and then changing whatever the relevant power of two uh, that is dividing into this number. And given a decrement instruction, I do the same thing. If I'm decrementing uh, register j, I first look and see if the jth prime divides into my number. If it does, I divide by pj just once to decrement the instruction, and then change whatever instruction that I'm doing uh, that I'm uh, pointing to. 
And if I can't divide by PJ, then I change the instruction to do the other thing, whatever the branching tells me to do if that register was empty. So that is the kind of way that I do the state transition. So that's the inductive step to define by induction this function, which given the inputs and the number of states that the number of steps of computation that we're going to do will tell us what state the program is in at state n. So now I want to figure out when does it terminate? Well, given the state number, I can construct a function which returns uh, the state that I'm in, just divide this number by two as many times as I can evenly, and then all I do is find the first uh, such n that makes this function return zero. And that's the function that I can minimize to tell me at what step of computation uh, the computation stops, if there is one. So the last thing that I need to do is to extract the result. Given the function that computes the state of the register machine at each step, I use minimization to find the step at which we halt. Then I feed that number of that step into my function, which describes what the code is doing to get the state of the machine when it's halting, if there is one. Then given this, I divide uh, out now by P1, that is the prime three, repeatedly to find out how many marbles there are in the first bucket. And this is the output value of the function. All of that was primitive recurs recursive, other than that minimization step. And that's it. Just put all of that together, and that gives you a recursive function which can represent the computation that this register machine is doing. What we've done by proving this is we've shown that every recursive function can be defined by means of a register machine, and we've shown that any recursive function can be given a definition in which minimization is only used once. So if I've got a recursive function, I've got a register machine which encodes it, I also know then that I can represent what this register machine is doing by that reasoning that we did now. And that gives us a definition of the function in which there's a heck of a lot of primitive recursive computation that is happening, but there's just one minimization loop, which is find where the register machine terminates if it does. Phew. What we've done here is we've given two very different ways of representing the idea of computability. One which is building it from the bottom up using basic functions and constructors, and the other, which is doing it in a holistic fashion using uh, the notion of an abstract computing machine. There are many other ways to define the notion of recursive functions using other um, abstract computing machines. One that you might have heard of is the idea of a Turing machine, uh, which is a very different kind of uh, abstract uh, computational machine. And this can be generalized in a number of different ways. And the really interesting thing about this is that lots of different ways of defining abstract computing machines, like Turing machines, post machines, tag systems, uh, Markov algorithms, uh, and other things, all turn out to define the same class of functions unless you put very specific restrictions on them. The notion of a recursive function seems very, very robust any way that you might think of defining a general sort of computing machine, unless you say it can only do this using this amount of memory or this amount of time. If you don't put those bounds on it, it turns out that you're basically going to be defining the same sort of thing. It turns out there's ways using the lambda calculus notation uh, that we've had to define these functions using uh, lambda generalization on particular basic functions. And there's another way of thinking about how it is to represent functions in a theory, which we'll see in the next section, which again will turn out to pick out exactly the same class of functions. So what we've got here is a, what seems like a very natural notion of computability, which can be got at in very many different ways. This leads people to make a particular hypothesis or a particular conjecture, which is sometimes called the, the Church-Turing thesis or the Church-Turing conjecture or the Church-Turing hypothesis, which is the claim that these functions 
are exactly the functions that can be computed in any reasonable sense of computation. You see here, what we've done is we've taken a particular precise sense of computation, computable by means of a register machine, and shown that those functions are the recursive functions, the ones that are built up from the basic functions by means of those constructors. Is this the only notion of being computable? Are there ways to compute functions which compute functions that are beyond this class? That's sort of a philosophical or a conceptual question, and it's one that we might spend some time thinking about in class. Uh, but it's one that if you're going to address it, you're going to not address it just by means of proving an equivalence between this notion and that notion when those notions have been formally defined, it's going to be a more sort of philosophical or conceptual uh, exploration of the idea of being computable and seeing are there other things that we can extract from that that will lead us to, again, conclude that these must be the recursive functions. But that's a great sort of philosophical and conceptual question that this raises. We've got this very natural notion is that the notion of computability full stop, or is there more that we can say about that? So, there's been a lot of content for this week. This is what you need to know about the equivalence between register machines uh, and recursive functions. Register machine computable functions and recursive functions. You need to know how to make register machines for basic functions and how you can stick them together using composition, recursion, and minimization. And then you need to know a little bit about the reverse, how we can represent computational steps numerically. And in the next class after this, we're going to look at what we can say about functions that aren't computable, that aren't recursive.